work. Now, I want to tell you this understanding of epigenetics because it's really important. Epigenetics to many is a buzzword. I don't want to use it as a buzzword. I need you to understand how it works for a simple reason. It's a revolution in our understanding of how life works. So I'm going to talk about epigenetics. I say, how does epigenetics work? And, I, and the answer is this. Environmental signals influence the proteins and the DNA in the chromosome. So environmental signals affect the chromosome. Well, in two ways. Some environmental signals actually alter the reading of the DNA, which I'll talk about. And how does it do that? It adds a, what's called a methyl group. And you say, all it adds is a little CH3, carbon, hydrogen 3. I say, yeah, the methyl group controls whether the gene is going to be copied or not copied. So the methylation says, are you going to be able to copy this gene or not copy the gene? So methylation selects which genes are going to be activated. And environmental signals also affect the protein. But when they affect the protein, they alter the reading of the gene. And this becomes profound because it's actually the regulation of the DNA is the protein, not the DNA. So I say, well, how does this really work? And I say, first of all, recognize this. You got two sets of chromosomes, one from your mother, one from your father. <clears throat> each chromosome generally uh, has uh, two genes, uh, well, one gene for each trait, but then you have a mother and a father chromosome, so that means every trait, let's say seven genes, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. I have two A's, two B's, two C's, etc. one from the mother, one from the father. Well, the interesting point is, which one am I going to read? Because in almost all cases, you only read one of the two. So how do I know which one to read? And the answer is, Information from epigenetics involves a process adding CH3 methyl groups, which generally silence the gene. So when I add the methyl groups and select specific genes, those genes are not going to be read. So what are the available genes after the methylation process? One of each. And which ones are selected are not random. They're based on how the mother is experiencing life before her egg is mature and how the father is experiencing life before the sperm is mature. Why? The controls on selecting which genes uh, are actually implied just at the moment of the maturation of the egg and the sperm. They reflect what's going on in the environment. So nature's not stupid just saying, hey, randomly pick genes. Nature says this gene would be better in this environment as opposed to this gene. So nature is selecting which of the genes are going to be used, the mothers or the fathers, based on what's going on in the environment at the time. <clears throat> and this is how uh, methylation works. So epigenetics in one part selects which genes can be read and which ones can't be read. But the other part affects the proteins, and I want to mention it in this way. This is a very critical part about epigenetics. Epigenetics changes the readout of the gene, but does not change the DNA code. So if you're born with a mutant gene, you can, you'll always have the mutant gene, but you may not have to read it as a mutant gene. So epigenetics uh, changes the readout, but does not change the DNA. I say, how does that do it? And I say, remember the old days when television wasn't on 24 hours a day? And I say, this is a test pattern. So this is a pattern, like a gene and it's coming from the broadcast station. And I say, well, the pattern, the gene, is coming from this broadcast. But I say, but if I mess with the dials on the television set, I can alter the shape of the pattern. Here's one form altering that pattern. Here's, I can alter it again by changing the dials on the television set. My most important question is, yes, I changed the expression of the pattern, but functionally, did I change the broadcast? Did I change the original pattern? The answer is no. It's still the same original pattern, but I can change the readout. I said, well, how does that work in our biology? I go, here's a strand of DNA. The loop part is the blueprint, a gene, to make a protein. I say, what about all that extra stuff around there that's not part of the gene? Well, <laughs> euphemistically, unaware people have referred to this as junk DNA. They say, oh, that's just the extra DNA. That's really nothing. A cell is so stupid, it's carried around a billion years extra junk. And it turns out, what is the junk DNA? And the answer is this. Built into that uh, DNA strand 
are protein modules, little clusters of proteins. And guess what these protein modules are? They are the equivalent of the dials on the television set. One is on and off, one is volume, one is contrast, focus, color. And so you can change the readout of the gene by affecting these protein modules. They are, in a sense, really uh, <clears throat> the dials on a television set. So the junk DNA is not junk, it is the most profoundly important DNA of all. Listen to this. The genes get mutated regularly. The junk DNA does not get mutated. It keeps itself very constant. Why? You are getting your pattern of who you are from the junk DNA and getting the parts from the gene DNA. So uh, epigenetics can influence either the gene or the protein modules. So when it alters the protein modules, that's protein regulation, turning the dials and changing the readout. And when it affects the gene, that's the methylation process that says whether you can read it or not. So epigenetics says which genes are going to be read and how they're going to be read.